Good evening and welcome to tonight's talk, Go West Young Man, Grafton Tyler Brown's Landscapes and the Complexities of the Frontier with Dr. Kirsten Pye Buick. My name is Kim Goff and I'm a learning program developer here at the Royal BC Museum. The Royal BC Museum is located on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen, the Songhees and the Squamont Nations. And we extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn on this territory. Please welcome the Royal BC Museum's Curator of Art and Images, Dr. India Young, for opening remarks. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining me tonight. Um, I see lots of friendly uh, um, virtual faces in the chat. Uh, uh, we're here tonight to um, hear from uh, a mentor of mine, Dr. Kirsten Pibuick, which I'll, who I'll introduce in a minute, um, moment um, to talk about the artist Grafton Tyler Brown and uh, to celebrate a new acquisition for the museum, Entrance to the Harbor, uh, which was painted here in Victoria in 1883 uh, while Brown was here for uh, just a handful of years. But I want to give all my time over to Kirsten, so let me um, introduce her. Dr. Kirsten Pybuick is a scholar of the visual and material culture of the first British Empire and the British diaspora in the US, Caribbean, and India at the University of New Mexico, where she's a professor of art history, the Associate Dean of Equity and Excellence, and the chair of the newly created Department of Africana Studies. Her interests encompass histories of science, medicine, religion, as well as monuments and the use of public space. Her work has been included in major anthologies, um, the Rutledge Companion to African American Art History and in Race and Vision of the 19th Century. In January of this year, she was invited by the Smithsonian and the United States Postal Service to participate in the ceremonies unveiling their newest stamp of another 19th century African-American artist, uh, Mary Edmonia Lewis, because of her seminal text, Child of Fire, Mary Edmonia Lewis, and the problem of art history's Black and Indian subject. I've been personally eagerly awaiting her next book, In Authenticity, quote, Kara Walker, and the Edicts of Racism, and among her many accolades, Dr. Buick has most recently been named the Distinguished Scholar by the College Art Association. And I had the true honor of witnessing her students pay tribute to her mentorship by sharing their own outstanding scholarship just the other week. Dr. Buick is a true mentor of mine as well. And she was the person who first introduced me to Dr. Grafton Tyler to Grafton Tyler Brown, the artist. And so without further ado, over to you, Dr. Buick. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be here. Um, start sharing my screen. Make this proper. So before I begin my lecture on Go West, Young Man, Grafton Tyler Brown's Landscapes and the Complexities of Frontier. I would like to read the land acknowledgement for the place where I am and where I've taught for over 20 years, the University of New Mexico. Founded in 1889, the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Dene, and Apache, since time immemorial, have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. And so when I was asked to give this lecture, I, um, I, I can't, uncouple it from the most recent manifestation of 19th century landscape representation, which is Kim Burns's documentary on the national parks, what he calls America's best idea. Before I dive in, I'd like to thank India Young, curator of arts and images and my former graduate student. And I would gratefully acknowledge the scholarship and dedication to Grafton Tyler Brown of Dr. John Lutz, I also acknowledge and um, thank the Department of History at the University of Victoria and Kim Goff 
learning program developer. And so I, in thinking about the description for this talk, I wrote, um, Grafton Tyler Brown was born black and free in Pennsylvania. And he distinguished himself as a landscape artist, which was unu an unusual medium for African-Americans. This talk will explore a cross section of Brown's work in key locations such as the Bay Area, Nevada Territory, British Columbia, Oregon, Yellowstone and Yosemite National Parks. His path marked the expansion of two empires, Canada and the United States, and tested the ideological meanings of frontier as a space created solely by the pioneering efforts of white men. I teach an, uh, an upper division survey called Amer um, landscape, American Landscapes. And we dive in by talking about how landscape representation was restricted in terms of medium. Women were discouraged from becoming landscape artists and there really was no place for black men. Landscape as one of the five types of paintings codified first in the French Royal Academy and then in the British Royal Academy were of particular importance because they represented the nation. And so they were restricted to people who could own that land and people who had the racial capacity and the gender capacity to aestheticize that land. And I always open the course with the first 15 minutes of Kim Burns's um, documentary because it, star it starts out with primordial ooze. And then you hear native chanting and native drumming. And you don't hear any indigenous voices until a park ranger in the middle of the first uh, disc, I think. But the first voice you hear is the voice of a white man who's the narrator. And then you hear a, an actor voicing John Muir, the man from Scotland who comes to the national parks. And then Ken Burns decides to drop in uh, a, a kind of testimony about the beauty of the parks. So we're in uh, Yellowstone and there are a group of white men who've come in to slaughter a peaceful village of indigenous uh, First Nations people. And one of the white men looks up from the slaughter and looks over and notices the beauty of the landscape. Now, Ken Burns does nothing with that. But the point I make to my students is there is a connection between the land acknowledgements that we give, between um, this kind of constant ongoing celebrations of firsts, whether it's the first are a black artist, you know, to, to paint landscapes in British Columbia, et cetera, or we celebrate these national parks as national wonders. When in fact, the connection between aesthetics and violence are here made apparent. And the other thing um, I'd like to show you is Grafton Tyler Brown in Yellowstone. This is from 1890. The park was about 16 years old when he went there. And in 1903, Theodore Roosevelt gives this speech. In the Grand Canyon, Arizona has a national wonder, a natural wonder, which so far as I know, is in kind absolutely unparalleled. Um, throughout the rest of the world. I want to ask you to do one thing in connection with your own interest and in the interest of the country to keep this great wonder of nature as it is now, leave it as it is. You cannot improve on it. The ages have been at work on it and man can only mar it. When you can do this, uh, what you can do is to keep it for your children, your children's children, and for all who come after you. Now, of course, he was talking about the Grand Canyon in Arizona. But here Grafton Tyler Brown is at the Grand Canyon in Yellowstone in Wyoming. But the website that I pulled this from makes the connection uh, and says that Grafton Tyler Brown, like Roosevelt, is part of this conservation uh, ethos 
uh, in the country at the time. But something else is going on as well. In around all of the kind of celebration of Grafton Tyler Brown. In 1868, and remember I said landscape was no place for women uh, nor any place for African Americans. It's also no place for Native Americans or uh, the Chinese people who helped build the Transcontinental Railroad in the United States. But in 1868, Frances Palmer, who was a woman, creates this image across the continent, westward the course of empire takes its way. And so the Civil War is over and the US government now has the time and resources plus armed black soldiers to go into the West and wage yet another war. And this one for land. And so lithography was different. It was ranked differently from uh, oil painting. And so Francis Palmer creates one of the most um, influential lithographs of the 19th century with this, uh, with this work. On the one side, you see the, the settlement of whites with their public institutions, signified by the public school. You see the trains filled with white people coming from New York and San, and San Francisco. Um, and then off in the distance on that side of the tr uh, train tracks, you see covered wagons who, bring civiliz who are bringing civilization west and who are going to replicate everywhere that they settle the town that you see in the foreground. And so the covered wagons themselves become uh, a kind of movable domestic space, right? They are the, the carriers of civilization. So you have geography that plays out here in terms of the train that cuts west, the covered wagons that precede it. And on the other side, you have Native Americans on horseback. And this is typical of 19th century uh, landscape. Native Americans are never shown farming or uh, living in, in villages or, or in the spaces that they created. Here, they're being literally erased by the superior technology of the train. The smoke wipes them away. And you see along the train tracks, telegraph poles, communication, right? Sophisticated, uh, the kind of all of the sophisticated signs of civilization, manifest destiny, and westward uh, movement. And then you see in the lake, uh, you see men on canoes, and they represent the French fur traders, who were some of the first Europeans uh, to, to settle the West, but who wipe themselves out genetically with their intermarriages among First Nations people. And so time and geography are both implicated in this lithograph. But um, the case for landscape is always an interesting one. And we, we start by looking at Barrett Morisot, who was French, who was one of the women involved in the Impressionist movement and who married a, a man who was always very um, supportive of directions she wanted to take her art. And so she told him one day, Eugene Manet, she married the more pliable Manet brother, I'd like to go paint the sea. I'd like to paint a seascape or landscape. And he says, yeah, sure, go, go ahead, go to the coast. And she does. But what happens is she becomes the spectacle Men surround her as she's out there in her big hat with the veil, trying to paint something that is not normally the province of women artists. And she becomes the spectacle. And she, she you know, this is one of a few landscapes that we know that she created. Women were also not really welcome to paint themselves in moments of intimacy. In this case, uh, Barrett Morisot attempts to uh, paint a woman at her toilette. Um, the painting is criticized and not really welcomed because women aren't 
allowed to paint this close to their their own selves, their own bodies, like like the like landscape, the nude, the female nude in particular, is the province of male artists. And so there's a reason why Georgia O'Keeffe becomes the first woman renowned for landscape uh, representation. It takes just that long and a marriage to um, Stieglitz to drive her to New Mexico where she reshapes herself, kind of de-sexes herself and becomes the crone of the desert. And so this speaks to landscapes uh, kind of performative properties that you just don't go to a place and paint it, you have to become that place. And New Mexico was that space for Georgia O'Keeffe. And, and it, was, it was quite a, a feat of artistic ingenuity and endeavor that allowed her to become uh, known for landscapes. But I'm showing you um, right now the, the landscape artists that we know of who were African-American active in the 19th century uh, and into the 20th century. At the top is Robert Selden Duncanson, uh, active in Ohio, James Presley Ball, uh, he dies in Hawaii. In the center, Edward Mitchell Bannister, who is one of the founders of the Rhode Island School of Design, goes to Rhode Island, and Edward uh, and Grafton Tyler Brown. And each one of these artists face their own challenges with regard to landscape representation. Uh, in the case of Duncanson, he attached himself for a while to uh, James Presley Ball because Ball ran a daguerreotype uh, kind of panorama uh, rooms in Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, featured Duncanson's landscapes on the walls of his daguerrean rooms. Uh, and so they, they partnered, and this was unusual. In fact, uh, Primus Nelson, an African-American artist who was active in San Francisco in the late 19th century and was there for the big earthquake in San Francisco, complained because Edward Mitchell Bannister, who was first active in Boston, never gave him a chance, never mentored him in the way that Ball had mentored Duncanson. And so there was a sense that there could only be one of us. There could only be one of us, one at a time, in these places that would allow us the freedom to not be marked by racism. In terms of the Civil War, Duncanson spent his time um, in Canada. And this is uh, Duncanson's painting of Owl's Head Mountain. It's at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. Uh, and Grafton Tyler Brown spent his time during the Civil War uh, in San Francisco. And so you might question or ask, why do they find refuge in these places? Why don't they choose to fight during the war? Well, in the early days of the Civil War, African-American men were not allowed to, um, to join. And I'll talk about that in a second, but I wanna show you all we have left of John Presley Ball's mammoth pictorial tour of the United States, his panorama. What's interesting about this, and all of the African-American artists I have shown you were all born free. They were all born free men of color. But John Presley Ball, uh, connects in his panorama the landscapes of Africa to um, the destructiveness of the slave trade, the Middle Passage, Charleston, South Carolina, the discovery of the Mississippi River. He goes through New Orleans and Natchez and plantations, and he actually names names of some of the most brutal uh, plantation owners. He he um, 
goes through Cincinnati and St. Louis and goes to Niagara Falls, the, the very symbol of U.S. landscape, the pride of U.S. landscape, Niagara Falls. And it's, it's James Presley Ball who connects those spaces. And so the function of landscape representation is that it normalizes the relational, performative, and participatory aspects of power according to gender, class, race, and sexual orientation. And think of the debates taking place at all levels of culture over bathrooms, which has become a proxy for the debate over whether trans people can exist in public spaces at all. So as I read through this, I want you to think about what it means to be an African-American man painting landscape. Landscape spatializes power. It maps power relations onto geography. And landscape representation empowers space to function as a proxy for power. Landscape representation racializes space and it spatializes race. It engenders space, and it spatializes gender. And the best example of that are the Jim Crow signs from the American Southeast and Southwest, where the landscape is literally divided according to race, so that people who live in close proximity can understand their relationship to power relative to what spaces they are allowed to occupy. And so landscape is a verb. It is also a process. And it has an imperial function. And the African-American artists I've shown you are not separate from that narrative. The Hudson River School was founded in the early 19th century by Thomas Cole. Cole was born in 1801 in England and his parents immigrated to uh, upstate New York in 1809. And in 1830, Cole made this very small painting as part of a project called Picturesque America. And he was tasked with painting Niagara Falls. And so he had quite a bit of work to do in terms of removing all the tourists, removing the uh, viewing platforms, removing the bustling of uh, First Nations people, the Iroquois who were there trading, uh, selling touristic objects, souvenirs. And what he does is he gives us a Niagara in autumn and two light sources. There's the light source, source that shines into the canvas, highlighting the foliage and the detail. And then there's the light source that comes out of the clouds, the metaphor for divine light. And then there are two Native Americans who stand on the precipice, who contemplate the inevitability of their removal. And so what Cole gives us is the, in a nutshell, the kind of imperial function of landscape. As I said, it was meant for a project called Picturesque America. That already tells you that they're looking at English landscape traditions and that the veil of convention is what masks the brutality of landscape. Landscape is normalized, it's boring to our eyes, but Paintings like Cole were actual training for, um, for people to be dropped down anywhere and aestheticize their experience. And so traditional landscape painting has a foreground, a middle distance, and a background. And so you were trained when you went out into actual landscapes to create those zones for yourself and aestheticize the experience, okay. Nowhere uh, is the imperial function of landscape representation more apparent than in 1859 when Frederick Edwin Church unveils 
his massive exhibition picture, Heart of the Andes. This is how it was shown at the Metropolitan Museum of Art right at the, the, on the cusp of the Civil War with three American presidents uh, enshrined over it. And what this tells you is that the United States had its eye on Ecuador, that South America in the rhetoric of, of empire, in the rhetoric of landscape representation was seen as a kind of garden of Eden. And that if we could turn our attention to South America, we could lessen the tensions that were uh, building internally and taking us towards war. But here's the painting. Uh, Frederick Edwin Church went on these geological surveys like Grafton Tyler Brown, made the maps, made the kind of technical drawings, but then made these paintings to send back uh, so that Americans would be um, enticed by these images of empty, grandiose, incredible spaces that this one day will be ours. So he takes three different climate zones, smushes them together, creates that lush foreground with foliage that could stand up to opera glasses. And imagine this lit uh, very provocatively under the red velvet. But one of the things you see is the graveyard of indigenous Ecuadorians, right? So this land, while it is a graveyard for its current inhabitants is a place of fertile promise for the United States. And I missed a slide. If you don't mind, I want to hop back to it because, hold on, there it is. So the reasons why uh, the artists I showed you, Duncanson, Ball, Brown, and Bannister uh, didn't join the war effort was because in the first days of the war, African-American men were not allowed to join. Uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, Lincoln said that black men could join, but if they enlist, enlisted, they were only paid $10 a month, $3 less than the pay of a white private. And they were given the dirtiest jobs of the war. They even got that far, however, because Frederick Douglass would go ritually to the White House and say, let black men enlist. They want to fight this war. And as soon as they were allowed to enlist, uh, Douglass sent his two sons, Lewis and Charles. But Lincoln never wanted black men to fight in the war because he was afraid that the war, the narrative around the war would be that it was over slavery and that it would make the war about race. And Lincoln wanted to keep it a white man's war and to make it about anything else other than race. But Douglas said in the speech from 1864, no war, but an abolition war. And so wilderness, west, and frontier. The idea of American progress is embedded in Protestantism. And in 1678, John Bunyan wrote, the pilgrim's progress from this world to that which is to come. And it was a Christian allegory written in England and it's regarded as one of the most significant works of English literature and has been translated into more than 200 languages. It's never been out of print. And it uses the metaphor of both a dream and a dreamers traversing through a landscape to tell the story of progress as a spiritual journey from damnation to salvation. And Notions of American progress are very much wedded to that idea and that ideal. 
wilderness scenes and wilderness themes in American art are also prevalent. And landscape is in particular important to the metaphor for the spiritual journey that is racialized and gendered. And this is Frederick Edwin Church, a Christian on the borders of the Valley of the Shadow of Death, his illustration of A Pilgrim's Progress from 1847. And so in terms of wilderness, um, Mary Beth Norton in redefining the Salem witch trials uh, as the Salem witchcraft crisis connects the concerns over the supernatural with concerns over trade, social structure, and the Indian wars on the main frontier, and makes clear that the responsibility for the crisis rests squarely with the colony's governor, council, and judges. And so the wilderness becomes in these instances, um, the home to witches, to the devil, but also to Indians. The wilderness was the space that defined those entities created out of the fevered imaginations of English men and women. Part of the dangers of the wilderness and of Native Americans was that often when Native Americans took English captives, the captives were reluctant to return to their English outposts. Much like John Bunyan's Pilgrim, the wilderness a spiritual test found its metaphor in landscape. But the concept of wilderness is born out of the English experience uh, of, of, the, of North America, right? They didn't find a Garden of Eden. They suffered plagues, water shortages, famines, a climate wholly unfamiliar to them, and a hostile indigenous populace. The wilderness, as I said, was the home of Indians, witches, as well as the devil. It was disorienting, literally, literally bewildering. A space that could turn men of God into the very entities that they were born to contest. Moreover, westward expansion was antithetical to New England conceptions of society as an organism rather than an aggregate made up of individuals whose movement threatened the integrity of the organism. And so Puritans developed the concept of the West to distinguish wilderness, a place where moral and spiritual exercises take place from the frontier, which is movement away from society for primarily commercial reasons. And so, there's the wilderness, there is the West, and there is the frontier. And frontier means movement, movement away from society for primarily commercial reasons. Edmonia Lewis was another artist who uh, uh, used wilderness themes in her art. And this one is the biblical, um, rendering of Hagar in the wilderness from the Old Testament. But I want to show you this slide because it's from it's I think it's very important in understanding how the how in the in conceptualizing frontier histories they paint the hostility between First Nations people and Europeans as implacably hostile and and divided from the very beginning. This is from Francis Jennings, The Ambiguous Iroquois Empire. And uh, he's writing about the covenant chain. And it's the formal cooperation between Indian tribes and British colonies. He says, this is a history impossible to conceive under the assumptions traditionally held by American historians until only a few years ago. And he's writing in 1984. He says the covenant chain has played no role in frontier histories devoted to demonstrating implacable hostility between so-called savage Indians and so-called civilized Europeans. The fallacy of thinking that enmity was inevitable between the two groups is demonstrated by comments such as Robert Livingston's letter of May 13, 1701. 
who wrote, of the five Iroquois nations, I did not enumerate the advantages arising from their firmness to this government of New York. They have fought our battles for us and been a constant barrier of defense between Virginia and Maryland and the French. And by their constant vigilance have prevented the French from making any descent that way. And in 1715, the British crowns Lords of Trade and Plantation presented their case to Secretary Stanhope writing, the five nations of Indians lying on the back of New York between the French of Canada and our settlements are the only barrier between the said French and their Indians and his majesty's plantations as far as Virginia and Maryland. And so we use the Western, the, the kind of popularly conceptualized Western to erase these alliances to make the hostilities seem fixed and permanent and to erase the contribution of First Nations people to empire. And at the US Capitol, uh, there's this um, pediment. It's simply called progress of civilization because they don't know what to do with it. But it was installed between 1855 and 1863 over the US Senate, which is the body of the US government responsible for consent and treaty making. And Thomas Crawford, who was living and working in Rome, uh, together with Montgomery Meigs, came together and decided on a theme for the pediment, which was to represent the progress of the white race and the degradation of the Indian with America uh, um, kind of emblematized in the center as a white woman on either side of her is a soldier and a pioneer who clears the forest, right? Who creates civilization. On one side are white men and boys, on the other Native Americans that terminates in an open grave here. I realized after teaching this for years that it was actually a secular last judgment and that America stands where Christ stands in, in those Catholic, in that Catholic iconography and every one to her proper left represent the damned, every one to her proper left represents the saved. This is yet another way of rendering landscape representation and it was a charge to the senators who processed under that, that pediment every day that the land was already forfeit, that you transform Native American uh, relationships to land to be understood as English forms of property so that you can divest them of that land in the courts. Now we have Grafton Tyler Brown. Uh, who was instrumental in, in crafting empire. And I think what's interesting about all of the African-American landscape artists that I've shown you is that as soon as they make through their talent a safe uh, space safe for civilization, if they did not choose to pass for white, they were run out of those places. They were run out by white businessmen uh, and white artists. And, and so the places that they'd made safe for so-called civilization were no longer safe for them. That's the irony of, of how we are conscripted and implicated by empire. So lith lithography was introduced to the East Coast of the United States from Europe in 1819. When gold was discovered in California in 1848, it triggered one of the largest migrations in US history. In just a few years, the population of the West Coast grew by hundreds of thousands. Lithographic publishing houses sprang up in San Francisco, producing so-called broadsides, news sheets, that kept newcomers abreast of the latest news and events. They also popularized the pictorial letter sheet, a form of stationery. Uh, people in California hand wrote letters on paper bearing dramatic scenes of life in California. As cities, towns, and settlements 
up and down the state continue to grow. Lithographers documented them in the form of postcards and maps. And so they were instrumental in creating property boundaries, right? In the invention of property in, in these territories. And you guys are lucky enough to have this uh, entrance to the harbor, uh, in Victoria, 1883, um, and is one of the few works from Brown's stay in Victoria. And you can see how serene this is. Um, you know, the foreground, the middle distance, and the background. As Angela Miller teaches us in her book, Empire of the Eye, the middle distance is the ideological space. It's the space where uh, civilization, the encroachment of civilization, is shown not to harm the beauties of nature. The fiction that they can coexist that uh, railroads and telegraph poles and streets and buildings won't interrupt the beauty of nature. And so uh, this, ideal, this, this ideological space is here present in Brown's painting. <clears throat> For me, what's interesting about this is Within Canadian history, um, it was the, the, the time of dominion, I, I think it's called, and I'm kind of barely reading from my notes, but Canada was consolidating as an empire at this very time. And so what Brown is creating is a scene that um, eliminates the costs of empire in terms of Canada's own extermination policy, policies relative to First Nations people. Um, <clears throat> the historian Carl Jacoby calls this an era of extermination. And he says that uh, relative to the United States in particular, that we shouldn't use the word genocide that we should use extermination, which is the word that the US government used. And that attending this, this word is the, the concept of the vanishing American, that Native Americans just somehow disappeared. And landscape representation was one of the most effective ways, not only of aestheticizing space, but showing policies of extermination and genocide as already happened, as, as, as leaving the land undisturbed. And so when we read our land acknowledgments, we, in our small way, undo the, the work of landscape and landscape representation is codified uh, in, in Europe and brought to this continent, uh, to North America, to Canada, to the US colonies, to continue to do the work of empire. This is another um, uh, lithograph by Grafton Tyler Brown's Lithography Company. It's a map of the Bodie Mining District and it's, it's claims, right? Claims to the mine and it's, it's wealth that has been uh, apportioned and assigned. Here's another uh, lith lithograph by Brown, the Market Street Homestead Association at San Francisco, 1867. And so these are not, um, these are in line with landscape representation. Maps are socially constructed, they are uh, engineered to give us other kinds of information about property and land ownership and beauty. This is Brown's uh, view of Lake Okanagan from British Columbia, 1882. It's in the Smithsonian. Like other landscape painters, Brown took part in geological surveys. In September of 1882, for example, he joined the Amos Bowman Geological Survey uh, Party uh, east of the Cascade Mountains in Canada and along the Fraser River 
and from that trip made sketches from the survey available to the public. That same year, he left the Bay Area after having run his own map making business, um, and which he'd, which he'd run for 20 years, due to an environment increasingly hostile to Black business owners. He moved to Victoria, British Columbia in Canada. And throughout his life, uh, Brown was able at strategic moments to pass for white. And you know that is work that uh, Professor John Lutz has, has done for us in terms of the, um, the identity, the various, the multiple identities of Grafton uh, Tyler Brown. This is uh, the city of Portland, Oregon. And he shows um, in the foreground, right? A scene of fishing and animal husbandry, the harbor and then background civilization and then all the important buildings that the city has created in 1861. He also created the logo for Wells Fargo and this is his um, um, one of his certificates that he designed for them. He worked for Levi Strauss. He worked for Ghirardelli Chocolate. And he helped with branding, the branding for corporations, the expansion of empire in, in the business world. And so he was an agent of empire, not inseparable from it. And this is the Wells Fargo logo to this day, and they still use his stagecoach. And this is um, Goldstream Falls, British Columbia. The painting on the left is from 1883, and the painting on the right from 1885. And he has a very distinctive style in terms of light uh, and, and perspective. I think. And I'm sorry about the quality of this one, but here he is in Yellowstone National Park painting Old Faithful. And when you when you go and you, when you read about Brown on most sites or in surveys of African American art, they always talk about how he's one of the earliest uh, Black people to go West and how he um, went to these sites and, and how as a landscape artist like Theodore Roosevelt, he was all about conservation and, and you know, keeping these places beautiful in our memories and, and um, but there's something else going on. National parks in the United States were once inhabited by First Nations people. Right? And so the beauty of these places are at the expense of the original inhabitants. And so the question we must answer, understanding that we are all conscripted to empire, is at whose expense? And I showed you Francis Palmer's lithograph of across the continent. One of the things she, uh, one of the groups she erases from her landscape, even as Native Americans are being erased by the, the smoke of the train, are Chinese laborers. And I mentioned them uh, before. They're completely gone in this rendering of, of the railroad. And between 1863 and 18, well, around 1869, they get displaced by prison labor and harsher and harsher uh, laws are put in place to um, discriminate and exclude Chinese people from immigrating. But um, they were attracted to California because of the gold rush, like other uh, people across the country. And I'm, I just want to show you two books I think are that do a great job talking about the work that they've done on the Transcontinental Railroad and how, um, in the case of Ikkyo Day's book, how Asian racialization uh, contribute to the logic of settler colonial capitalism. And in the middle is a sign 
the, some of the meetings that were held to exclude the Chinese uh, from uh, this country, to exclude Chinese people from this country. And this, I, I wanted to show you the painting by Charles Austin from 1949. And it's the Negro in California history, exploration and colonization. And here he was tasked by the Golden State Mutual Building, which was the insurance company of Black Los Angeles to celebrate African-Americans and their contribution to the history and to the settlement of California. But what does Alston do? In the foreground, on the left, and in the latest um, survey of African-American art, Lisa Farrington unfortunately cuts this part away. It's not in the textbook. But what he gives us is a soldier, a black soldier dressed in Union uh, blues, post-Civil War, and black men have been armed, overseeing the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. But he turns the Chinese men who, who labor to create this railroad <clears throat> into faceless, uh, uh, kind of faceless repetition of conical hats that disappear into the distance. And so we're all implicated in, in, in landscape and in, you know, at whose expense? I always ask my students that. So landscape, Lands, landscape functions as an arena of symbolic action, a quasi utopian endeavor that helps to order culturally a space inherently open-ended and unstable. Landscape is an instrument, perhaps even an agent of power that frequently represents itself as independent of human intentions. The various media used to represent landscape are always already secondary representations because as we tend to forget, the subject matter is not simply raw material, but is always already a symbolic form in its own right. And this is from Timothy J. Mitchell, Landscape and Power. He says, landscape is not an object to be seen or a text to be read, but a process by which social and subjective identities are formed. And that one is from uh, Cosgrove and Daniel's Landscape and Iconography. And finally, landscape is a function of ideology, whether racial or gendered or classed, or in the words of Del Upton, landscape is an extension of ideological processes. Nature is a construct more productively conceptualized as the culture of nature. Landscape is a communicating event that results from and results in culture. This from Henry Glassy. While culture is an arrangement of ideas, a cognitive structure of generative principles, worrying and grinding intention. And finally, Timothy J. Mitchell, landscape is a verb. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. I so miss your classes. <laughs> um, thank you so much for that um, captivating lecture. I have so many more books to read as usual. Um, right now, I'd like to welcome Dr. John Lutz, um, who Kirsten mentioned earlier, uh, as uh, Victoria's resident uh, Brown Scholar to kick off the Q&A with your first question, if you have good internet. Wow, what an amazing much, uh, Kirsten, that was amazing. Um, and um, I want to give a shout out to Robert Chandler, who wrote the book um, uh, about Robert Brown, the San Francisco lithographer, which really is the basis of my work. I, I really can't claim much originality in my scholarship. Much of, most of what I know comes from, from Robert. Um, that was uh, amazing. And so many questions. And you've, you've really helped us I put, to put uh, Grafton Tyler Brown into a much larger landscape than I had placed him in, for sure. Um, I wonder if you would do me a favor, though. Could you take us back to the slide, the Alston slide, the Negro in California history? Yes. 
And I'm wondering if that's Grafton Tyler Brown there in the lithography room, because there wouldn't be a many black lithographers in, in California. In fact, I'm sure he was like the, probably the only black lithographer in California. Uh, mm -hmm. And I wonder if on the left there above the Chinese miner, there's a print shop. And um, I wonder if he is directly referencing Brown there. I, that, that's not the question I had for you. I have a big question for you, but there's a small question there to give you uh, something to, to, to think mm -hmm. about. Yeah, he he very it very well might be. Um, Alston knew of Brown and lithography and printmaking was, you know, exactly how African American artists who you know had to teach as well as pursue their creative practices, printmaking was very important to them, and they would have known of Grafton Tyler Brown. Mm. I think it's a, just a fun thought that he might be immortalized there. Is, is that mural <laughs> visible and extant in the in, in California? Uh, it was. It, it's it's been moved. The Golden State Mutual Building uh, sold off its collection, so it's somewhere. It's it's been collected along with the co companion mural. So yeah, I was lucky to see it. And like I said, the latest uh, survey of African American art completely cuts out the uh, uh, Chinese laborers, which is unfortunate. Yes, well, so, you know, there's so much uh, in your talk, and I guess one of the lines that really sticks out for me um, is the idea that uh, while um, Black artists are landscaping, and I love your way of framing as a verb, they're landscaping and they're making, I think you said, making America, Canada safe for civilization, mm -hmm. they're making it unsafe for them or making it more unsafe mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we can see Brown in this context. I think, um, you know, I, I always think of him as in a very vulnerable position because mm -hmm. San Francisco, he was known as, as the black uh, lithographer. And, he, and, and this is a very small world of people circulating between Portland and Victoria and San Francisco and later on Helena, Montana. And, and so he's, uh, although he's uh, doing his best to kind of make a way in a, in a white man's world um, and presumably doing what he loved as an artist, um, you know, he's very vulnerable, uh, and, and like you say, he's, he's, while he's making the world unsafe, uh, safe for America and Canada, he's, he's, he's making it very safe for himself. And I guess my, my, my question for you really is, so, so does his positionality make a difference uh, in, in his kind of role? So you gave us the example of uh, Frances Palmer and her Westward Empire um, uh, iconographic image. Mm -hmm. uh, Brown is, you know, doing, as you kind of point out, sort of similar work, um, vanishing indigenous people in his work, um, you know, idealizing this natural landscape as somehow pristine and pure. And um, the, the, the image that we, you showed us from Victoria early on, the, the one that the museum has just acquired, is a bit of an anomaly. He painted a few kind of urban scenes around Victoria, but mostly it was the landscapes that he painted. Mm -hmm. is, is, is there anything different in, in, in what he does and what he's doing in his landscaping than say uh, Francis Palmer, uh, do you think, for, based on his, where, where he came from, how he got to be where he came from? Yeah, I, I, I really don't think so because landscape is so cloaked in convention in order to make it legible. You know, we borrow from European methods and, and so there's nothing benign about landscape. Um, you know, this is a, an example I give to my students, there's a very famous furniture maker in North Carolina uh, in the antebellum South. And he enslaved his workers, you know, he was a slave owner. And I tell my students, there's no such thing as a good master. Okay? And so um, I shop at Amazon, right? I, I don't do Facebook, but I have to choose I have to choose the tools of empire. And so um, while it, as I said, it was, it was brave and it was unusual for African-American men to enter the, the realm of landscape representation, there's nothing in my opinion different or softer or more benign in, in their representations because landscape is already a compromised medium. I love your, uh, I, your phrase that we're all conscripts of, of imperialism. And uh, like you say, we all 
have to shop at Amazon or Walmart or someplace like that. Uh -huh. And um, you know, one could uh, one could argue that in my role as a university professor, there's some way that I'm a conscript of empire uh, there too. So um, I, 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 um, I, I don't begrudge you your salary or the need to <laughs> eat. Well, <laughs> we all have to do some self-examination, I would say. Right. I'm happy to right. do so. So um, I don't know, Andy, if you want to open up the floor to others, I'm happy to keep on um, uh, having this lovely discussion. Oh, you're muted still, I think. There haven't been too many questions, but I kind of wanted to follow up um, and talk about the, uh, the role of lithography um, in its relation to commerce and um, uh, in, in the way that landscape painting is uh, not neutral and never benign. Um, would you be able to talk a little bit more about how the role of the print um, and the print medium, such like lithography, um, it, uh, has, potentially has a relationship? Do you think it has a relationship to the notions of commerce and frontier that Brown is using when he um, is doing his surveys yes. of territory and land? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, maybe that transition, um, I, I certainly have um, posited, uh, or probably both of you have posited, and I have read it from you, that uh, that it is through um, first um, tra tracking land as a lithographer doing these bird's eye views mm -hmm. of uh, place, uh, and as he's um, he, he realizes that power that you have that you gain from defining and uh, conscripting territory um, that then he leverages to into the next phase of landscape painting into that next um, uh, echelon of, you know, how mm -hmm. art, how, how the creation of a certain kind of art allows you to be perceived by the public um, in a new and more um, elite, mm -hmm. um, valuable um, way. Mm -hmm. That's not a question. That's, that's well. I Gordon Miller, who wrote in the chat, um, I think, said landscape art is a commercial activity. In order for art to be purchased, viewed, the work must be in the public taste that is consistent with the purchaser's worldview, and that's very much the case. And and I don't see, uh, I you know, prints have their specific function, and landscape paintings have theirs, and they work together. Right, to circumscribe empire, to define uh, place and to define empire. And I, I couldn't stay out of the chats. Uh, Kim Shortread said, I'm wondering if you could talk about the role of colonial understanding of time in the landscape idealization project. I love that, the first part of that question. I'm gonna answer that first before I get to the rest. So in the United States in 1888, the railroad barons got together and cut the country into zones and said, people are no longer going to live according to the seasons or according to the sun or according to the church clock. They are going to live according to standardized time. And they did this in this country without going to Congress. They were sued. The, court, the cases were taken all the way to the Supreme Court. But the reason that I am at 7 p.m. and you're at where you are is because of the railroad. And so there is a role uh, in terms of colonial understanding of time that affects all of us. Um, if one of the roles of the constructed landscape is to envisage some kind of perpetual Eden, this is good, what happens after colonization and industrialization trenches it? Frontier never stops. And so the rhetoric of frontier is more useful to us than the actual frontier. Uh, and Albert Bowen makes this case in his book on uh, the magisterial gaze. And he says, we took the rhetoric of the frontier and transferred it to the space race. And that, that, that's the danger of this kind of thinking. The frontier never ends. 
Uh, and so does this Eden shift accordingly or does it remain as the earlier Edenic ideal? It shifts, it shifts. Great question, thank you. Um, we have a couple others in the chat. Um, Dennis Nauman asked, did Grafton Tyler Brown have a lot of business competition during his time in Victoria? And was there a large market for his work at this time? I can tackle that one, or maybe if you want to, John. <laughs> well, I could just uh, say that, uh, no, he didn't have a lot of comp. Well, um, when the colonist uh, exhibited his art here, uh, they, they declared he was the first uh, commercial artist, the first artist to live by their paintings that ever existed in British Columbia in 1883 84. So he didn't have a lot of competition in that regard. There were quite a few amateur painters, uh, and a lot of them were women, actually. Um, who uh, painted as a hobby and probably shared and sold their paintings. Uh, I, don't, I don't know to what extent. So on the one hand, yes. On the other hand, uh, no. I'm just looking over my notes. Um, and we do have one other question uh, from Amanda McLeod. Is entrance to the harbor currently on display at the RBCM? And if not, will it be so anytime soon to actually see it in person? Um, thanks for that question, Amanda. It is. Uh, currently available to researchers um, through the VC archives, but it is not, um, it, there are no plans to have it on exhibit uh, yet. Uh, what is, um, I was trying to, to place where the, this particular painting is in Victoria. And what is interesting, um, is that the vista, the sort of the vantage point where uh, Brown is standing, um, uh, all of this land is Lekwungen land, all of it's uh, indigenous land. And at the time, uh, the governments of British Columbia uh, and the nation state of Canada are displacing the Songhees and Esquimalt nations um, further and further away from this inner harbor territory. And this vantage point is one of the places to which they are displaced. Um, and it looks back on the place now known as James Bay, um, mm -hmm. named after James Douglas, um, the, uh, uh, a um, Hudson Bay trader who sets up uh, both farms and government in uh, the, the background or the, the what is the, the, the background of this painting? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, and in that background, uh, the land is literally being plotted into, um, you know, sex of farming specifically allocated to um, white settlers. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, uh, um, Brown is situating himself in the place of the displaced in this particular painting. Um, and what is also interesting about that uh, right now is that that land was repurchased by the First Nations, that specific place where he's standing um, from the government of BC in 2005. Uh, and it is right next to the current military site of, um, uh, it's, of fascinating. it's fascinating. <laughs> Uh, Spain. Oh, I was wondering if you had any, um, uh, what's the, if you had any, no, but <laughs> can, I jump in with a, can I jump in with a question? Please. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, well, not so much a question, but you've helped me uh, see Brown in a different light and you pointed out that he um, first comes to British Columbia as part of a geological survey expedition, which uh, again, I hadn't thought of him as kind of eyes of empire and kind of, um, you know, helping map the geology of a part of British Columbia that, you know, it actually has quite a few mines in it now. So, um, so he's, um, and on the timing again, um, I haven't made this connection until you uh, raised it, um, but it's uh, the Trans-Canadian Railway, Trans the Canadian Pacific Railway is being built at the exact same time, right? And um, so um, undoubtedly he's kind of crossing a pass with some of the construction workers 
um, as he's making his way up the Fraser River. And so um, uh, it's, all, it's all happening in this kind of moment of um, this large imperial land grab uh, as you know, displacing indigenous people. And of course, Chinese workers are working when they, when they got chased out of the United States, they came up to work on, on the railways in Canada. Yeah. And then 18, 1885 is when we passed our head tax legislation to try and limit and, and keep indigenous or uh, keep Chinese people up. Always to your earlier question, um, Dr. Lutz, uh, if you know if you remember the panorama I showed you by John uh, James Presley Ball, where he connects the African slave trade to landscape, the most popular tourist sites in the United States. There's one instance where landscape, there's an attempt to make it work against itself. And what's interesting is at the time that Ball made his lands, his panorama, there were other panoramas made by African-Americans who had been enslaved. Uh, Henry Box Brown was one, and I'm forgetting the other uh, panorama uh, creator, but their panoramas were considered less uh, convincing and factual. And it, I think it has to do with the fact that Ball was born free. And so his experience of enslavement was like the audiences who crowded his, his galleries, who were white and who were free and, and who regularly were suspicious of the evidence presented by enslaved people or people who had form, been form, formerly enslaved. And so even though Ball is attempting to make landscape work against itself, he's still on the side of, of freedom. It, landscape is fascinating. I, I always try and convince my students it's not as boring as it looks. <laughs> and and uh, you know, Ball seems to be one of the few successes uh, of somebody able to, uh, to use the medium, as you say, against itself or uh, develop a critical stance. And I wonder how, how successful an artist was he? Uh, I mean, how did, did that, did that book sell and maybe if it did because it was a time of a strong abolition ascendant in the United States? Um, yeah, it did, but you know, he goes to Hawaii. He goes to, uh, uh, he dies in a place that US corporations had overtaken. You know, they, they planted their, their flag and they told the US military, if you don't come in here and save us, and saving meant Queen Lily Uokalani has to step down. And that's where Ball goes. There are three more questions in the Q&A um, uh, and we'll save Kim uh, short treats for last. Uh, Dennis Nauman has asked, does British Columbia have many works that were, does Brown have many works that were painted in British Columbia? And he, um, to my knowledge, there were 22 from his time in the Okanagan and his time in Victoria. And then did he work as a lithographer in Victoria? And I believe he did, but I'm not 100% sure. Does it die in either of you? I, I think he left his lithography behind in San Francisco. Um, and, um, and then, uh, you know, he uh, painted for a number of years, not for a long period, and then he became a professional photographer, I think, when he moved uh, uh, to the Mississippi to retire. So he had a variety of artistic um, expressions in, in his work. And Kim asks, mm -hmm. I'm hoping you could expand on some of the ways in which we could see landscape painting as cartography's cousin. Landscape painting has no typical cartographic marks, but nevertheless, seems like an instant um, instantiation. instantiation of presence or at least a particular gaze upon the land. Mm -hmm. It seems a lot to me like a similar feeling, a kind of ownership through indexing. Absolutely, absolutely it is. Um, and you know, that starts out with the naming of views. Mm. Naming is extremely important in, in cartography in landscape representation because once you've named it you've commodified it and if you're a tourist you do it right you have this checklist of places to do and you got to buy all your gear to go out there uh, and so 
cartography and landscape representation are you know two sides of the same coin and and coin being the operative word it's, yeah it's about possession it's about commodification it's about power i'm uh intrigued by your um comments on frontier, on positioning frontier uh, in relation to commerce uh, mm -hmm. and that it is going into um, or moving beyond. Uh, and this is actually uh, old scholarship. Uh, you know, the, this is from an essay written in the 1950s on the Puritan, and I'll send it to you, India, the okay. Puritan's concept of wilderness. You know, they came here expecting to find a Garden of Eden. Instead, they found this place, you know, thanks to the abominations of Leviticus, they couldn't eat anything, <laughs> right? They were starving. It's like, what is this place? And, and they, they couldn't keep it together, you know, as they got more and more help from First Nations people, they started disaggregating, coming apart, and, and the West becomes that, that space between the wilderness and the frontier. And so West is process. West is constant motion. Mm -hmm. And it is for earning and um, claiming through commerce. Mm. Well, thank you very much, My Dr. Pleasure. Padua. Congratulations <laughs> again on um, uh, your uh, um, being named Distinguished Award by CCA. And um, for your new position as chair uh, in the Department of uh, Africana Studies. It's thank you. Going to be an exciting program for the University of Mexico. <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Lutz, for sharing thank your time. Thank you, Dr. Lutz. It was an honor.